Um, the, the talk will be a, a little bit about why we're doing the assessments, a little bit about how we're doing the assessments, and then try to focus it most on, okay, and how are, what are the products that come out of an assessment and how are we using that? So just a quick step back, uh, uh, why are we doing this? Uh, you know, managing reefs for resilience is about, obviously, ultimately, we need to reduce emissions. Um, it's becoming increasingly, increasingly clear, uh, and I think there's going to be some discussion later this week about the need for active restoration as a part of effective strategies for uh, managing reefs for resilience. But really, at the end of the day, a lot of what we can do and should be doing is reducing local, local stressors to enhance, uh, preserve, restore the resilience of reefs. If you have unlimited resources, just reduce all of the stressors in all the places, call it a day, and feel good about yourself. If, on the other hand, resources are limited, which they always are, where does it make the most sense to, to do that work? What are, the, what are the places where you should be focusing on reducing stressors? Uh, and, and what are the stressors that you should, be, you should be reducing? So the whole idea behind these assessments is something that a number of folks uh, this morning have talked about, and Pete, initially, is, is basically it's all predicated on the idea that not all reefs are created equal. Uh, there are definitely, reefs differ very much in their ability to resist or recover from, uh, from climate change. And the idea is that you can use these assessment protocols as a way of, of looking at which reefs are likely to fare better or worse under a changing climate and use that information to guide the allocation of resources in, in your place for managing your area. So we're looking at using resilience assessments as the idea, as, as a way to identify the most resilient areas that maybe wants to consider as priorities for management action and what are the stressors that are most impinging on the resilience of those sites and those become priorities for management action uh, for, reducing, for reducing local stressors. So I mentioned this is a case study, so most of what I'll be talking about is work that we did in West Hawaii, which was a huge collaborative effort. Actually, Jeff Maynard, who you've heard uh, mentioned a few times, was a big part of that, and fantastic support uh, and partnership from NOAA, as well as our local state uh, coral reef management agency. Um, the general idea with resilience assessment methods, this is obviously the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, first step is determine your area of interest. What is your management unit? What is the area that you're responsible for? In our instance, it was this sort of northern part of the west coast of Hawaii Island. Um, within that, uh, select a suite of representative uh, habitats, survey a suite of representative habitats with those resilience assessments. So the process we did with, to identify those areas was consult with NOAA, consult with community partners, and consult with our state management agency to come up with a suite of priority areas. Uh, if you can see it on the map now, there's, there's all the dots represent the areas we surveyed as part of the resilience assessment. The yellow dots are the areas that were identified by our partners as priority sites. And then we took all the effort that we had available to us for these assessments and spread the rest of it across that entire area to ensure that we were getting a, a full look at the full suite of habitats uh, and, and the ge geographies within our specific area of interest. Um, and then one thing to note about uh, assessments is that these are relative assessments of resilience potential. This is not a, a tool that will allow you to say how resilient are the reefs of Hawaii compared to the Great Barrier Reef. It's a tool that will allow you to say within the area that we've been doing the surveys, which are the areas that have the greatest potential, which are the areas that have the greatest challenges. Uh, it's relative to your area of survey. Uh, for the methods that we used, uh, Lizzie just talked about that a bit. Uh, this is the, this table uh, has the list of indicators that came out of that McClanahan et al. 2012 paper, and then now highlighted in green are the suite of indicators that we were able to survey as part of our assessment in West Way. As you can see, it's most of them. <laughs> uh, uh, so, 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 uh, so what we did was went to all of those sites in that previous slide and collected all of the data on this slide and collected all this information on the, the, the suite of indicators for resilience at these sites, analyzed that data, and used it to come up with a suite of resilience rankings. So now on this slide, you see a map of our study area, and then the color ramp on, those, uh, on the, the, the slides shows the green areas are the sites that were predicted from the resilience assessment as having the highest relative resilience potential. The red areas, the areas with the lowest relative resilience potential. Uh, and again, this is 
you, taking in that whole suite of resilience indicators, uh, which are the ones that generally scored highest, like had highest coral cover, the most co uh, temperature resistant coral species, highest coral recruitment, et cetera, um, and what have you. Uh, from our study in particular, we found that, that these rankings were, were mostly driven by uh, the presence of bleaching resistant corals, coral recruitment levels, and macroalgal cover. You can see on that map that generally the southern sites scored higher, the northern sites had some more challenges, and resilience is a little more uh, uh, problematic in the northern suite of sites. And really importantly, it was really highly variable. So across this suite of indicators, which the which we think are good indicators of how, uh, predicting how a reef will fare over time, there was a lot of variation. Not all of these sites were created equal. Some are much better positioned than others for withstanding the effects of climate change. Um, and, and so this is a process that allows, allows us to identify those areas that are most likely to be able to resist or recover from the effects of climate change. So, so this is the sort of primary output or the, the, the primary way of showing those results. Um, you can also look at it in tabular form. So now this is just that exact same suite of information. All of the sites uh, sorted now by the order of the resilience ranking with the highest resilience sites on top, lowest resilience sites on bottom, same color ramp. One of the things that I actually find really useful is we can then drill down into the data a little farther and look at, I know this looks terrible, but I swear it's not that bad, the, the scores for each of the different resilience indicators and how they fared, uh, how each site fared across that suite of resilience indicators relative to the other sites. So uh, CC is coral cover, CD is coral uh, disease, CR, coral recruitment. So for each of these resilience indicators, you can see how an individual site fared. And this can be useful in a couple of different ways. One, if you're a manager, say, and you're thinking about enacting fisheries reform that could influence herbivore biomass, which is HB up on that table. Okay, what are the sites that might benefit the most from fisheries management and protectant of herbivores? And then use that, use that table to say, hmm, okay, here are the sites that might benefit, uh, benefit most, and how does that compare against uh, what the other things that are going on in that site? Uh, the other way of using it is if you're interested in a particular site, understanding what's going on in that site and what might be the most important thing to do there. So say our, our most resilient site in this study was Laiho, um, which is a site that it's, it's, has no formal management protection, it's the highest resilient site. If we're looking at that saying, hmm, what might, might we be able to do to ensure that that site stays, stays resilient or even enhance the resilient of, resilience of that site, can we look at its... Uh, its performance across that suite of indicators and say, what are the things that we could help? One of the things that stands out obviously with this is herbivore biomass at that site is relatively low, so that site looks great, except there aren't many herbivores. Maybe that's something we should think about addressing. Uh, conversely, if we look at the, the sites that are on the lowest uh, res uh, end of that resilience ranking, um, one of the things about these resilience assessments is, you know, we shouldn't think about it as, as a uh, one-stop shop to rank a bunch of sites and say, okay, I'm just going to work on the top five outputs of these resilience rankings, done, ignore all the rest. It's, this should be one of the pieces of information that managers should look to and use to make decisions about where to work and what to do. Uh, and it doesn't mean don't work in lower resilient sites. We had a good conversation at the end of the last break about the value actually of thinking about sites that have, have challenges and have benefits that come from successfully dealing with those challenges. So it doesn't mean don't work there, but it does mean be clear about the challenges that site is, con is confronted with and be sure that you have a clear sense of how you're going to be able to address those if you're going to work in that site. Don't work in low resilient sites with no clear strategy for identifying and addressing the, the critical threats that are affecting that site. Know what you're going into. If there are a whole bunch of reasons to still work in that area, and actually Puoko on Hawaii Island is actually a, a primary management site for NOAA, for the state, for the Nature Conservancy, there are a bunch of reasons to work there that I could go into if you're interested later. Um, but we all need to be clear, there are some challenges and we need to have effective strategies for dealing with those challenges. Uh, let's see. So, so that's the resilience scores themselves based off of the ecological indicators. We were also able to compare those resilience indicators against information on anthropogenic, anthropogenic stressors that came from the Ocean Tipping Points project that Jen mentioned earlier. So now you see a suite of panels. Each of those panels represents 
the level of a different type of anthropogenic stress along that stretch of coastline. So I apologize, the, the font is a little bit small, but across the top are a suite of fishing measures, measures of fishing pressure, uh, water quality, sediment, development, invasive species, et cetera. So we had information on all of those stressors to compare against our resilience rankings. And by, by comparing the, the resilience rankings against this suite of stressors, we were able to say, okay, what are sites that say have high resilience but have no formal management? Well, those might be areas that we want to prioritize for, for thinking about including in some sort of spatial management so that, that we can ensure that that high resi resilience potential continu continues into the future. But what about areas that say have moderate resilience but are uh, struggling with issues with water quality? Well, those then would become sites where we'd want to look at uh, developing solutions for addressing water quality at those sites. Same for sedimentation. Um, uh, identify sites where that would benefit the most uh, from addressing sediment. Uh, the idea of this being what are the things that we can do in the local place, what are the mo local stressors that we should be focusing our management efforts on to reduce the sensitivity of these areas to climate change, enhancing their, their resilience potential. And so by doing that analysis, we were able to, across the whole suite of sites that we surveyed, come up with a suite of recommendations for sites and stressors and say, for each of these sites, here are, based on the resilience rankings and the threat, the information that we had available on threats, the recommendations we would make for the stressors to address in those places. So like starting at that top of the figure, you know, like that first site, it's about uh, addressing fishing pressure and sedimentation and water quality. Down from that, it's looking at, um, uh, at uh, supporting recovery, managing water quality and sediment. So that's just a key showing the, the specific management actions that are recommended through this resilience assessment uh, approach or protocol. <clears throat> and then, uh, so the, those, that suite of information, the, the resilience rankings, the site-based information on the, the resilience indicators, the uh, local stressors and management recommendations were the suite of information that we took, put together in the technical report that we produced and shared with, with project partners <clears throat> to uh, help guide uh, thinking about management actions in those places. That was just one of several things that we did to share the results of these surveys. And, and uh, folks have talked about it a fair bit, Lizzie, uh, uh, just a minute ago, that sharing the results of these surveys is critically important, uh, that we've actually found the, uh, uh, one of the key benefits to these surveys is they actually create really good opportunities to start talking to people about reefs, the conditions of reefs, the futures of reefs, and the urgent need for improving management because things that we do to look, manage local stressors can make a difference if we do the right things in the right places now-ish. Um, and, and so that's that, like one of the enabling conditions for doing assessments is uh, um, making sure that, that you have that political will. I would say that it works the other way around too, which is doing these assessments and having a very effective, thoughtful, strategic communications plan for talking about what you found from those surveys and why it's important can be a way of creating political will for action. And so, so we not only created technical reports, we also got a lot of media coverage, again, with a lot of thought put into what are the messages. And uh, again, we can get into that more uh, later if you guys want, but the message is not that all the reefs are dead and dying and there's nothing we can do. <laughs> the message is that, <laughs> that there, is, there are things that we can and should and need to be doing now. Uh, also shared the information a lot with communities. Uh, in Hawaii, a lot of the a lot, meaning absolutely all of the political will to affect change comes from the communities that advocate for change in their place. So we really viewed talking with communities as our primary vehicle for catalyzing change. Uh, and we prepare, prepared a bunch of informational handouts to share the results. I'll give you a, some examples of these things. For instance, one of the things that we did for every single site that we surveyed, we came up with these just sort of two page sheets that summarize the results of our surveys and everything we found for that site so that if a community was interested um, 
and, and better management for that area, we could go straight to them and say, here's what we know, here's what we learned, here's the information we have on what's going well and the things that need to be addressed in your site. The state management um, agency loved these because it was just a, a really quick, easy to grab a cheat sheet that they could go with any community and take to any community meeting they were going to, to, to jumpstart a conversation with them about, about their site and the needs of that site. Um, we also, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, did our first round of resilience surveys at this site during the height of a major 2015 bleaching event, which is the first mass bleaching event uh, that had ever been recorded in Hawaii. So we used that as an opportunity to share information about the bleaching event, about resilience, and about the urgency for improving our management action and, and created an informational handout that we gave to anyone and everyone that we possibly could to get, to get folks starting to think about uh, and incorporating resilience ideas into their thinking. When we first started doing this work uh, a number of years ago, no one in the state was really talking that much about climate change and the effects on reefs and resilience. And now everyone talks about it as though it's something that, well, sure, of course, like that didn't happen by accident. <laughs> that was a part of uh, efforts by a number of, of groups, ours very much included, to get folks talking about and thinking about and really socializing that idea of resilience and the importance of incorporating that into management actions. Um, uh, the information has also been incorporated with other data available for the West Hawaii area on Hawaii Island um, by Jeff Maynard and Jamie Gove into a vulnerability assessment. And in this vulnerability assessment, uh, Jen talked about it briefly earlier, but what they've done is combine exposure data, so the projected changes in thermal stress along this coastline, with the information that we collected on the resilience indicators, and added in that information on the human impacts from the Ocean Tipping Points Project, and came up with projections on the vulnerability of the, the, of the coastline to guide discussions about what are the areas that are gonna have the greatest challenges, what are the areas that have the greatest advantages for dealing with changing climate, and bring that information into our management conversations. Speaking about our management conversations, the biggest thing for us in Hawaii right now is called the Sustainable Hawaii Initiative, or we think of it more colloquially as the 30 by 30 initiative. This was a, a state initiative inspired actually by the Micronesian Challenge, where the state is committing to effectively managing 30% of nearshore waters and terrestrial uh, environments by 2030. Jen mentioned it a bit earlier. Um, the work that we've done for the resilience surveys fits directly into the 30 by 30 marine management policy goal. So not only are we using this to inform actions in local places to address stressors, but also statewide policy efforts. And the way that's happening is essentially by taking the data that we're collecting from these resilience assessments. This figure now is, is from similar work that we did in west uh, and the leeward coast of Maui Island. But bringing the information on resilience into the, the um, both the decision, decision support tools like MarkSan that the state is using to develop science, the science recommendations for what a network of uh, marine managed areas across the state, 30% of the state, should look like, as well as integrating it into SeaSketch, which is a, a visualization tool that the state is looking at using to, to take around to communities to have conversations with them about the what management could and should look like in their place and how their community could fit into this 30 by 30 goal, this network of marine managed areas. So the resilience information that we're collecting is directly integrated into, uh, into both the, the science recommendations and the community outreach components um, of the, that 30 by 30 initiative. Um, and, and in part because of the success of the resilience assessments that we did in West Hawaii and on Leeward Maui, the state now has also been very interested in, again, working with Jeff at coming up with statewide vulnerability assessments. So that's this right here is a draft product from Jeff taking, he doesn't have all of the data that we collected as part of the resilience uh, assessments like Lizzie had mentioned, like there's a bunch of new stuff with assessments, uh, resilience assessments, looking at things like coral condition and coral recruitment and all that that aren't part of standard monitoring protocols. But a lot of the information is the same. There's a ton of that other stuff for the state and Jeff took all of that information for the other stuff for all across the state and came up with this vulnerability assessment for the entire state. And again, this is being integrated directly into the policy conversations, the, the planning for this 30 by 30 initiative. Um, 
that's the, the Hawaii example of, of case study of how we are using these resilience assessments to try to inform um, management action. Uh, Lizzie mentioned it uh, briefly and I just wanted to touch on it briefly as well. There's a bunch of other ways that you can use resilience assessments, different ways in which it can be applied to management issues in your area. One is very close to home and actually a, um, a big part of Roger's life I believe for a while which is uh, in the Keppel Islands where re resilience assessments were used as part of guiding uh, protected area development and also inciting no anchoring buoys in areas in high resilient areas to decrease physical damage to those sites so that the most resilient sites were protected from physical damage, preserving their resilience. Uh, in uh, Puerto Morales uh, National Park in Mexico, resilience assessments were used for a whole suite of things, including citing invasive species uh, removals and actually relocating tourism activity so that areas where there was the high resilient sites or ecologically vulnerable sites with a ton of tourism activity, they have, have uh, moved uh, tourism activity away from from those sites to enhance the resilience of those sites. Or uh, St. Croix, Lizzie mentioned it just a minute ago, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, they've been using these assessments to site uh, coral restoration sites, which is actually something that we're looking to do in Hawaii too in the coming uh, in the coming years. So there's a broad suite of ways in which the results of these assessments can be used to tangibly, meaningfully, and in the short term, change how we are managing reefs in our areas. With that. Uh, thought in mind to climate change and how to enhance, preserve, restore the resilience of sites to a changing climate. So um, in conclusion, that's the coming back to where we started off with the idea with these assessments was to try to um, to be able to identify the most resilient areas and the most critical uh, stressors to address through management actions and hopefully through this uh, presentation you've got a sense for ways in which resilience assessments can be used to prioritize actions to uh, reduce local stressors, can be used to help guide policy initiatives in looking at spatial management and what should be happening where, and, and critically important to how communicating about and being really str strategic and thoughtful about messaging about these kinds of assessments can be a really valuable uh, tool to help uh, create political will to, to get the, the resources necessary to do those other things. Uh, and with that, that's all I have, uh, and I will save questions for later. <laughs> Thank you.